Hey everybody, um, it's Susan here, and today we're going to talk about email marketing for startups as part of the 500 Startups Marketing Hell Week. Um, I really appreciate your time, and I hope that this is useful for you. So first, a little bit about me. I've done email and content marketing for a bunch of different content-focused businesses, from AppSumo to IWillTeachYouToBeRich.com, one of the largest internet marketing empires out there, um, to other content businesses that went through acquisitions, etc. Um, so the first question, I guess, that you must, you, I hope you're asking yourselves is, does email marketing still work? Will it work for me? And how? And why? The short answer to all of these questions is yes. Email marketing or email remarketing, as it's more accurately termed, plays a role for every single business, including yours and yours, and yours, and yours, all of yours. I'm 100% confident on this, and I'll go into the details of why during the course of this webinar, um, so stay with me. I had asked you earlier how many of you are collecting emails right now, and how many of you are actually emailing those emails that you're collecting. So I think it's really great that a lot of people know that at least to throw up a collector on your site, um, on your different social media profiles, that's definitely step zero or maybe like negative one for email marketing. But there's a lot more to it than that. So we're going to get into that now. Oh, before I get going too far, here's how you can contact me. You can email me anytime at susan at 500.co and we'll schedule time to do office hours or chat more or do email review. Um, you can find me on Twitter at, at Susan F. Sue. Facebook, same username, LinkedIn, Susan Sue. Please connect with me on LinkedIn, and then you can see who all my contacts are in case I can help you facilitate intros or anything else. So back to that quick overview. The main reason that I like and maybe love email is because email equals money, and it is so nice and direct. Email is the highest ROI marketing channel that there is. It is still the highest ROI marketing channel that there is, simply because of a few different reasons. A, many people will join your email list just because you ask them to join. Just because you put a collector up there and say, hey, join our email list, they'll go, hmm, okay, I'm on. B, once someone is on your email list, it doesn't cost you any incremental marketing spend to promote to them. So it's extremely valuable once you have their email address on your email list. That's your own property rather than uh, a space that you're renting on a, um, on a paid channel. C, there are no display algorithms to game as with SEO or with social feeds. There's no mystery about that. D, lead response to email marketing is highly trackable even with one-to-one -one sales emails or emails to investors or even emails to the friends you're trying to stalk or the girl or guy you're trying to date if you want to know if they're opening your emails. If you use tools like Sidekick from HubSpot or Tout App that are using pixel tracking in emails that resemble personal Gmail style emails. Um, the next reason I love email is because it's so widespread. There are now 4 billion email accounts around the world and that's an increasing number of which, I made this joke earlier, an increasing number of which are not AOL or Hotmail accounts, which I tend to think of as a little bit as uh, the lower value email accounts. Finally, 25% of those 4 billion email accounts are business accounts. They're people's work emails. So this is really great news for people who are doing B2B. Um, and the other thing is, in general, people to tend to check their work emails and open emails in their work emails a lot more than just in their personal emails because they're, they have to. But, so all that sounds great, but here is the reality. So this is a screenshot of my own email inbox on a random day uh, on which I decided to take this screenshot. And I know it's really scary. I've been told by many people that my inbox looks really scary. And I know that it's not just that 32,194 unreads that is looming in the upper right there. Um, it's scary because I woke up and between the hours of 1 a.m. and 9 a.m. I got uh, 25 emails, some of which have that yellow priority thing, some of which don't. So how does an email marketer break through all of that noise? The reality is that the average person gets over 500 marketing emails per month. And that's the average person, not 
a high value recipient who might get even more. For example, I definitely get more than 500 marketing emails per month. I actually,、um, I recently tur- I had, I was away from my email completely for 10 days and I checked my email and, and afterward and I, I checked the number before and after and I think I had received something like 1,800 new emails in that 10 days. Um, and, and part of that is because I get a lot, I'm on a lot of lists with 500 and all that. And plus, I subscribe to a lot of emails because I'm always studying email marketing. But still, that's, it's a, that's a pretty scary number in 10 days, 1800.、Um, so, how, with, given that landscape, how do you get people to actually open the emails you've painstakingly written, scheduled, automated, optimized, whatever? Average open rates across most industries are around 23 to 25%. This can be higher if your list is really targeted or small or new or niche. It can be lower if you bought the list.、Um, but if it's significantly lower, you should be seriously looking at your lead quality and also your email content.、Um, but even still, 23 to 25% is not that much if you're, unless your list is really, really big. Um, so, just a note on that, you, as I mentioned, you will get a higher open rate if your list is really targeted, which has more to do with subscriber acquisition. And you'll also get a higher open rate if your brand is well recognized, i.e., you can name drop a nice brand name in the from,、uh, in the from field. But what if you're just a startup starting out? And you have none of those things going for you. You don't have a massive list. You don't have a really targeted list just yet. And you don't have a household name that you can stick in the from field. The number one problem in most startups' email marketing is not that they're not doing it. But once you start, you have an even bigger problem, which is that inbox that I showed you. As a founder or as the growth person in a startup, you're totally focused on your startup. And this is great, you have to be, it's your job, and you need to do that in order for your company to survive. However, it's also just as important, equally important to remember that the people on your email list don't give a shit about your company. They don't know, can't even remember its name, they don't know what you do, they can't remember what the product is, they don't know what your di- distinction is, they don't know how you're different from the Airbnb of X.、Um, they might not even know what Airbnb is, okay, by now they probably do. But my point is, they're not spending much of their time or any of their time thinking about you. So that's why it's your job to hypnotize your prospects with customer clairvoyance, great psychological copywriting, and behavior intelligent triggers so that your email marketing hits them right when they're the hungriest. Look, email marketing is really tough because there is a lot of noise, and email has been around for a long time. It's a channel that marketers have been using for a long time. But it's also still critical to try. It's a channel that's still absolutely critical to try, if not to master, because there's a lot of upside. It doesn't matter what category your business is in, and it doesn't matter if you're selling to consumers or to other businesses. Okay, so this slide is a little bit like my own pet peeve about the word blast. I've heard email blasts bandied around in email marketing circles. And、um, I personally don't like this because I come from the direct response background. It's a copywriter's background, it's an internet marketer's background. We don't really like to blast people, we like to be really sneaky and psychological and personalized and、um, really get inside the heads of the people that are reading our emails, not blast them. Now, that said, some marketers can afford to blast their lists, but I'm willing to bet that none of you will fall into that category. Not even willing to bet, I know for sure none of you fall into that category. And that's because the marketers that can afford to blast their lists with large impersonal broadcasts usually have very large lists, or they're always acquiring more and more and more emails at a very rapid rate.、Um, they also can leverage complementary brand spend. Brand marketing spend that helps their brand name stay recognized, that gives them that from field boost、um, and helps them get their emails more opened. And they might even be running an email driven affiliate business、um, as part of their primary you know, revenue generation of their business. So they don't really care if they're blasting people because that's kind of the job of their, that's the whole point of their business. Now, if none of those things describe you, then you will not be blasting anyone. So we can go ahead and scratch that word from our email marketing vocabulary. 
So email marketing isn't about a single standalone campaign that you can just push out there and forget or cross your fingers and and keep refreshing your MailChimp and hope that they get opened. Um, Email remarketing, whether that's for B2B sales to get a prospect to schedule a demo call with you or for user onboarding and activation or for re-engaging dormant or churn users, even whether that's to a potential investor or potential hire that you're trying to recruit, Email remarketing is all about structuring out your roadmap of campaigns that will help you build your very own Rome, email Rome, brick by brick. Tactically speaking, you should be mapping out where your drop-offs are in your activation or conversion funnel, and then using email marketing to patch those drop-offs. So let's say you're getting a bunch of web signups on your site, but then those signups don't ever come back to browse your products. Let's say you're an e-commerce company and you the those signups aren't coming back to browse, which is a precursor to purchase. They have to browse stuff, have to at least look at stuff before they buy it. In that case, you'd want to map out your welcome and activation campaigns. That first week of your signups experience with your brand and the products you offer. And then you'd want to consistently diligently and doggedly remarket to them via email, which is your owned channel. Remember, it's an owned channel, not a rented channel like uh, AdWords or Facebook ads or um, anything else, since you actually have their email address. So you'd want to keep remarketing remarketing to them until they activate or until you're 95% sure that they're never going to activate, whichever comes first. Engagement campaigns can help you keep users warm and coming back, and they can also be equally useful for B2B or B2C. Reactivation campaigns are for those perfectly good users who've just kind of dropped off or they've gone dormant and somehow forgotten how cool you are and how great your product is. And here again, don't be afraid to remind them consistently, diligently, and doggedly. That's why you have their email. That's why they gave you their email. Here's a hint. If you do this with great psychological copywriting, you won't ever be annoying. You will be alluring and you will be very effective. Finally, a special call out, special shout out to my bro, transactional emails. Why are transactional emails so cool and what are they? Um, Well, transactional emails are your typical password reset, confirmation of sign up, confirmation of registration, account info, username info. And they are an excellent opportunity to convince and convert because transactional emails have the highest open rates across the board of any type of email. And that makes sense. It's just logical. If you just signed up for a service and you want to check out your username and login details and then you get that right in your inbox right away, you're going to open it. If you requested a password reset, duh, you're going to open that email so that you can continue through and finish out that action that you began. Um, So anyway, transactional emails are a really great chance to include a little bit of promotion or some branding along with your run-of-the-mill transactional info. Okay, like everything in marketing and maybe in life, email is a funnel. Very few people buy at the top of any funnel. Don't worry about using email remarketing to get people to an immediate conversion. Instead, break down your funnel into its smaller stages and then use email or other complementary messaging like SMS, push notifications, or social to build them towards conversion brick by brick, funnel stage by funnel stage. Okay, now we're going to get into my golden rules of email marketing. Um... These slides will obviously be available online, so you don't have to take extensive notes here. Just kind of follow along and enjoy the ride. Um, Golden rule number one, most of you have this down already, I believe, is always be collecting. It's really important to collect emails every single place you can, persistently across your site, um, on every page, really great on any content marketing you're doing. So don't just put content out there like a blog post or an infographic with no purpose. What are you doing it for? 
the call to action at the end of your content, and by the way, all content should always have a call to action, a great call to action at the end of any content would be join our email list for more cool stuff like this. Um, Pop-ups are extremely effective. I don't know how you guys feel about them, but I don't really care because they work. Uh, and a really great way to implement pop-ups is to use exit intent so that they don't interrupt the user experience as they're browsing your site, but they only appear when the user is about to leave anyway. Um, another great place to always be collecting is on your own and all the rest of your team's email signatures and on, on their profiles um, in different places. It's a small thing, but it adds up, and it's also good signaling that everybody's on the same page and cares about growth. Um, you can also use paid acquisition campaigns to build your email list. So I told this story earlier, but I think it bears repeating here. Um, at AppSumo, we, part of the way that we built our 700,000 subscriber strong email list was by promoting offer really popular offers like PictoChart um, through Facebook ads. And then in order to redeem the offer, in order to get that offer, of course, email collection is part of it. Um, and so once we have those people on our email list, then they're no longer just a Facebook user that we have to pay to access over and over again. We actually have that user on our email list so we can remarket future, we could remarket future promotions to them, future offers to them at no additional incremental cost, which goes back to that first reason of why email is so awesome. It's an owned channel. It's not a rented channel. Um, offline is a great way to collect emails too. If you go to events yourself, if you're ever a speaker at an event, if you're invited to a meetup and you're somehow at the center of 50, 100, 200 people, think of that as an opportunity to get those 50, 100, 200 people all onto your email list. Uh, I have a story from a 500 partner who shall remain unnamed who sp told me she want, she had collected at one point some 3,000 business cards, 3,000 business cards. And one weekend she just blasted through all of them and entered them onto, into her LinkedIn through some kind of, through the, like a card reader app. And um, actually that's connected to the last point about always be collecting because you can actually export all of your contacts from LinkedIn, whether you have 300 or 500 or 3,000 or 10,000, you can export those contacts, you can export their email information, and then you can either retarget them through um, Facebook retargeting or you can add them to your email list and then of course give them the option to unsubscribe if they're not interested, but a great friendly way to engage um, people who are your in your LinkedIn network who are very likely interested in what you're doing as a startup founder is just to send a really genuine friendly email out that's like, hey guys, here's what I've been up to. We met you know, at this or that conference. Um, and now I'm a 500 founder. I'm part of batch 14. I'm part of, um, doing this project with my company. And here's a quick update. If you're interested, here's a link and check it out. Otherwise I'll catch you next time. Okay. The golden, golden rule number two is be persistent. There is nothing magical about this first email. And there's nothing, there's even nothing, even less nothing, I don't know if that's possible, but there's also nothing magical about Annalisa's second email. So the first one right here, no reply. I didn't reply for months, and uh, maybe weeks, and then she probably could have followed up a little bit sooner, but uh, whenever she did follow up, eventually I replied immediately, immediately same day within hours. Um, and there's nothing special about the second email except repetition. Um, a lot of founders are afraid to spam people who are on your email list or to email them too many times, but believe me, most people, um, there's actually a stat out there that most people only open every other email that they receive from a brand, even if they're your, they're your most engaged subscribers are still only opening every other email, and that's simply because people don't have time, they forget about you, it gets pushed down in their inbox, whatever reason, um, and 90% of the reasons have nothing to do with their affinity for your brand. They have nothing to do with their desire to read your content or their lack of desire to read your content. People most likely want to see your stuff. If they subscribe to your list, they subscribe for a reason. So keep that in mind. And here's a quote from a recent batch founder that I was working with. She said, I just wanted to say thank you so much, Susan, for telling us to email the cold leads up to five times. You were totally right. People started to respond to us on the third or fourth or even later email. And in those responses, they would apologize to us for not getting back to us earlier, saying things like, oh, I was on vacation. I'm so sorry. When can we meet? 
And then we ended up closing 30 demos in the last week alone. Um, and that's actually enormous because they were doing zero, de they had been closing zero demos before that because they would email once, email maybe twice, and then when they didn't get a, when they heard the crickets chirping and they didn't get a reply, they would kind of tuck their tail, turn tail and scurry away thinking, oh, they don't like us, they're not interested, we shouldn't bother them, we shouldn't spam them. Well, it turns out that wasn't the case at all because their prospects actually responded after multiple email, after multiple unresponseless uh, emails, only to apologize for not responding sooner. Um, so yeah, that's, that's actually pretty interesting. And I would encourage all of you to, if you're doing B2B and you're emailing cold leads, don't be afraid to email five or seven times and just schedule that stuff out so that it's not, um, a decision that you have to make every time, but just a rule that you systematically have a flow of five to seven emails that you send to every prospect if you're B2B. And then if you're B2C, same thing, but even higher frequency. Okay, so the next golden rule is that subject lines matter. They matter incredibly. And, but, and I think most of us know that. We think, okay, subject lines are what gets the email opened, which is mostly true. It's not the only thing that gets your emailed, email opened, but it's a very important part of uh, factor into email open rates. But subject lines don't just impact open rates. They impact a subscriber's perception of your entire email. Subject line optimization, therefore, is not just about boosting your open rates, but actually about improving your total conversions. And just like all marketing, just like email marketing, just like life, subject, subject lines themselves are a funnel. That means the first 10 to 15 characters are the most important, and every word after that is less important. So use action words in your subject lines and look at the subject lines that you receive from the brands that you subscribe to that are the most hot and, um, and juicy and irresistible to you and learn from those. Uh, I do want to say actually a special, I had a little note in here for myself. I do want to make a special call out about really, really hot words. So it is actually very important to beware of spamminess. Hot words are great, but too many hot words like free in all caps, a bunch of dollar signs, or the word money in all caps, those kind of words will negatively affect your deliverability rates. So it can be good to consider other ways to communicate those concepts and don't use all caps. Learned that one the hard way myself because I love all caps. Okay, so next, in the next few slides, we're going to look at a few top internet marketing subject lines that leverage psychological triggers and psychological copywriting. I love the internet marketers. If you guys are not subscribed to at least a few internet marketers, then please create a test inbox or create a folder in your inbox and go and subscribe and study what these guys are doing. These guys don't have real products that they sell. They just sell information. Just. I don't know why I say just, but they sell information and they make so much money doing it that they don't actually have to take funding or worry about investors or anything like that. Okay, so in this first slide, we're going to, the first one that we're going to look at is looking at reciprocity. The subject line here from Brian Dean of Backlinko, the subject line is how to get 25k visitors per month, new ebook, no charge. This might seem like a simple ebook freebie email, but there's actually a ton going on here in this example of reciprocity. First of all, this is the first content-heavy email that Brian sends you after you subscribe to his list. I think the first one is like you're on the list or confirmed or something like that. So this is the first one with real content. He doesn't tell you beforehand anywhere on the sign-up or on the landing page that you're about to get any info or free ebook on how to get 25k visitors per month. So um, that's kind of like an extra little surprise there. Secondly, the offer itself is very compelling. 25,000 new visitors a month is a number that seems low enough to be realistic and not a totally bombastic exaggeration, but still high enough to get most people's attention. He makes his offer really clear and overt right in the subject line, but again, he avoids those spam filters and he softens the freebie feel by saying no charge instead of free in all caps, which I warned you about. 
Um, so by the way, though, free, the concept of free is the key driver behind reciprocity in all situations, whether that is content in your email marketing or just your neighbor lending you a free hand. Free is much more than a hot word. It's actually a hot concept that piques our receptors whenever and wherever we pick up on it. And it's one of the most effective and high converting hot button concepts to use in email marketing. But that said, it doesn't have to be and even shouldn't always be just the word free. Um, and the reason for that is because, for example, here, the world of SEO info can be really distastefully full of overhype. Brian uses no charge instead of free so that he can still hit that free hot button, but he doesn't trigger our scammy marketing filters and he doesn't trigger the email service providers spam filters. There's a lot of strong copy happening in this one single message, especially where he summarizes the specific value of the offer. Look closely at those bullet points. But I'm going to stop here and say as a final word on this example that the ebook itself, which was a surprise, once again, it's a surprise gift. You didn't hear about it before, which triggers reciprocity even more strongly. That ebook is really, truly, excellently good. It was so good that after I downloaded it and skimmed it, I was a little bit skeptical, but after I skimmed it, I had to read it again in full, and then I felt immediately compelled to write Brian a personal thank you. I had never spoken to him before, but I found his email address, his personal email address, and just wrote him a thank you note and saying, wow, that ebook was really great. I didn't know I was so into SEO or I needed so much education, but thank you. Um, and ever since that, I've felt indebted to spread the good word, spread the Brian Dean gospel about th that ebook and all his other content, just like I'm doing right now to all of you guys. This is reciprocity in action. What did he give me but a free ebook? And now I've been doing his promotion for him for like six months straight. By the way, Brian also resends this exact same email. Again, it's that repetition tactic. A little bit later uh, once you've been his subscriber for a few months and I knew that because I was looking for this email again in my inbox so I searched in Gmail for the title and I found oh wow there's another instance of it and you'll find that a lot of the internet marketers do that I have a have an inbox on which I've been subscribed to some of the top internet marketing lists for since 2008 and one of my favorite things to do is pick out random subject lines and then put them in the Gmail search and see how many times they've been used and reused. And then you can see like all the little iterative tests that they've been running on their copy that way too because each email is a little bit different. Okay, so the next psychological factor we're going to look at is commitment and consistency. What does making a commitment mean and does it really work? People flake out all the time, especially, so I hear, in California, right? Well, some marketers think that leveraging commitment means getting a user to check a box on the site, to do agree via a checkbox, but actually it can be a lot deeper than that. Commitment and consistency have to do with identity as much as they have to do with explicit individual actions like checking a checkbox. We implicitly commit to an identity with all the things that we've done in the past. In taking an action, we're implicitly making a commitment to the identity that that action is associated with. So commitment and consistency can be overt, as in explicitly asking subscribers to make a commitment to step up their health, to support original artists, or to work harder on their business. Or it can be subtle, as in this example from Ramit. Ramit's subject line immediately evokes an identity commitment, especially for people who are already part of his audience, but it works for new subscribers too. You are committing not to a specific action per se, but to being the kind of person who isn't afraid to be excellent and who isn't going to shrink away because of what your loser friends and detractors might say about you when, you're when they find out you're going to do a personal development product which Ramit is going to sell you in a few short emails. My point here is that Ramit very effectively sets up an identity commitment and then counts on our need to remain consistent to our identity commitments to help drive you towards conversion. Okay, most of us know about social proof, or at least we think we do. 
We humans have evolved as social creatures, surviving best in groups. To this day, no matter how independent we think we are, we still look around at the people around us for cues on how to act and even what to think. We all know this. The asterisk here is which people. The best use of social proof and email marketing leverages dynamics like in-group, out-group, the cool people and famous people, celebrities are doing it, and validation by critical mass. A lot of people are doing this. Everybody's doing this. Where are you? So let's take a look at these four, uh, these three subject lines here. Um, a critical aspect of social proof is creating an in-group versus an out-group or an us versus a, a them. And as the marketer, aligning yourself in the in-group with the recipient. The subject line, people get mad when you don't fit in their box, draws a subtle but very strong line in the sand between us a group that includes the sender and the recipient, and them, the people who get mad when you don't fit in their box. Using quotation marks around box and, and um, side effects in the preview text, one of the craziest side effects of getting good at something, um, further derides the other people, the out group, and reinforces social belonging to the in group, which includes, which includes the sender and the recipient in the same group. Um, celebrities are doing it is an, is an approach we can see in the tout email that says how the Golden State Warriors use tout to measure engagement and other tout stories. Um, well, this is really awesome because we all know who the Golden State Warriors are, especially here in the San Francisco Bay Area where tout has a lot of their customers. And that is pretty strong social proof. Hey, that's cool. The Golden State Warriors are using tout. That's really eye-catching in the inbox because not a lot of technology emails are mentioning the Golden State Warriors. It's something more fun that doesn't remind us so much of business and their famous sports heroes. Um, in the third email, sub subject line, win, win, win. Win is such a hot word. It's not going to necessarily trigger the spam filter of the way free and money are, but it's so powerful because when the human eyes see the word win, there's just like all this like dopamine stuff that goes off in our brain because we all want to win. Who doesn't want to win? But the preview text is what I really want to point out in this email. So Rumit writes, Hi Susan, a few years ago, a reporter from Fortune magazine followed me around for several months and dot dot dot. Whoa, damn, a reporter from Fortune magazine followed Ramit around for several months? He must be really important. What am I missing? Let me open this email and find out. So that is social proof in action. Name dropping the VIPs can be really, really effective as with the Golden State Warriors or with Fortune Magazine. But the key is that the VIP has to have relevant sway with the recipient audience. So it has to be a VIP that they care about. With Ramit's audience, it's kind of like success-oriented people that are interested in entrepre entrepreneurship and finance. Fortune Magazine is the perfect uh, brand that is uh, really admirable and holds a lot of authority to that audience. Um, for Tout, the Golden State Warriors are kind of like hometown local heroes. So again, it's very relevant to their audience. Liking. All right, so here's a fact. We are more likely to do things for people we like than for people we don't like. Obviously, we're more likely to believe them. We're more likely to be persuaded by them. We're more likely to buy things from them. We're more likely to randomly give them money just because they ask us to. Um, so the use of the like factor is very obvious in ads featuring attractive people or in direct sales where salespeople really try to be liked because it helps them do their jobs more effectively. But how does it translate to email marketing when you can't really see a person, you can't really interact with a person face-to-face? -face? In addition to simply adopting a friendly and friend-oriented tone, the most effective usages of the like factor in email marketing leverage four things, praise, association, familiarity, and similarity. Noah, my friend Noah's subject line in this email is one of my favorite subject lines that I have ever read in my life. It has a call to action right in the subject line, so it's nice and strong. Um, and even though it uses some pretty strong language, it's essentially earnest, straightforward, and friendly. He's calling on association, 
work with me, subtle praise, if you open this email and work with me, then you're bold or you're fucking bold. And of course, familiarity, because he's using very familiar language. In the second email, David D'Angelo, uh, which is a marketing pseudonym for Evan Pagan, one of the top internet info marketers of all time, um, who is the creator of Double Your Dating, an online info business that teaches men dating skills and confidence. That's a $20 million annual business, not too bad for an information-only product that's primarily marketed through email. Um, Evan Pagan, in this subject line, leverages association, familiarity, and similarity. A regular-looking guy is presumably what the subscriber feels like he is, and also the kind of guy that David D'Angelo is suggesting that he himself is. Thus, we are alike, you and I. And if I can solve it, you can solve it. We're on the same side of the table. Authority is communicated in a ton of ways, and we're not even fully conscious of all of them. Um, recognize celebrities like the president, a news anchor, um, personal figure, per personal authority figures like our parents, teachers, societal authority figures like police, um, security officers, or clergy as demonstrated by their uniforms, or wealth or high status authority. Those are all different types of authority that we um, recognize and kind of bow down to whether we, our conscious minds want to or not. To identify authority, we rely on three simple things. Titles, clothes, and trappings. Um, and just a side note here, in a 1968 study, researchers discovered that 50% of drivers who were stuck behind a luxury car, a luxury car, that didn't go at a green traffic light, refrained from honking. They instead just sat there and did nothing. They waited respectfully. However, when the same delay happened behind a regular car, an economy car, as the study calls it, nearly all of the drivers honked and two even rammed the rear bumper of the economy car. So little respect that they, did they have. Okay, so celebrities are obviously authority figures today in this day and age. Um, and this extends to celebrities like Warren Buffett, Barack Obama, or even the celebrity concept of an MBA. Um, so in these emails, Neil, Neil Patel, who is a really great marketer, I highly recommend you subscribe to his emails in your test email inbox. Um, his subject line says, get your MBA in internet marketing. Well, Neil's audience are people that are interested in marketing, that are interested in kind of beginning business skills. And MBA is very uh, both aspirational, but it also holds a lot of authority, institutional authority for that audience. Um, Cal Newport, who's uh, actually a CS professor, a computer science professor at Georgetown University, um, whom I know and has a really great email list, really thoughtful emails. He doesn't necessarily sell anything hardcore. He has got a book called Study Hacks. And his audience are you know, well-educated, kind of productivity-oriented people interested in you know, self-development towards living more productive, more meaningful lives. Of course, they're going to admire in figures like Warren Buffett or Barack Obama. And so when Cal uses the authority of names like Warren Buffett or Barack Obama in his subject lines, um, it's really great for his open rates. Next, we're talking about scarcity. So scarcity is the most, the single most well-known and probably the most widely used psychological trigger by your average email marketer. We've all received those emails, just two days to, left to shop for delivery by Christmas. That's the deadline technique. Uh, I don't know if that's the official name for it, but that's what I call it, the deadline technique. The deadline technique is so widely used and abused that I personally believe we, we've become pretty much numb to it. Not because it doesn't work, but because we no longer believe that the deadlines are 100% true. The most effective usages of the deadline technique follow through on the promise to expire an offer or an opportunity by the deadline specified. So if you are going to use the deadline technique, as AppSumo does in these um, five emails that I've uh, put on my slide here, you must be ready to follow through on that commitment. You must be ready to expire that offer, which um, AppSumo is really, really good about doing. 
The limited number technique is often used together with the deadline technique. I don't have an example of it on this slide, but here's, what you can, here's how you can use the limited number technique. Um, only 11 seats remaining, only five seats remaining, only three units remaining. Hurry and last chance to get this. Uh, so by the way, Kickstarter is very effective at combining limited number and deadline at the same time because they actually show the increase in scarcity as both availability and time countdown. So scarcity increases because availability and time decrease. And they're really great at getting people to go ahead and commit and act right away because of the way that clock is ticking. Fears and aspirations are really powerful behavior triggers used almost constantly by psychological copywriters and by the best email marketers. Your average email marketers and even startup email marketers are likely to know that they should be painting a picture of what their customers could become with the help of their product, which is an example of aspiration, plain and simple. But what most startup email marketers fail to do or maybe are afraid to do even when they do use aspiration, is to understand that aspiration makes the most sense and is the most powerful and maybe is only powerful in the context of its opposite, fear. In the examples on these slides, fear and aspiration go hand in hand. Eben Pagan, under the pseudonym of David D'Angelo, articulates fear overtly here. Even using the word fear in the subject lines themselves, not in one of the ones I have here, but in some of the other subject lines, he will use the word fear. But look at some of the other words that he uses. Dangerous, the most dangerous mistake you can make with a woman. Ooh, that's scary. Competition from other men and how to handle it. That's got both fear and aspiration. Competition is the fear. How to handle it is the aspiration. The key to making her laugh with you, not at you, also contains both fear, laughing at you, and aspiration, laughing with you. How can a startup use the one-two punch of fear and aspiration? So let's see, just as an example, if you're selling a software as a service product, a customer fear that you could explicitly spell out might be wasting time, wasting money, wasting thousands of dollars, wasting specific amount of money, leaving a specific amount of money on the table, or looking bad in a very specific, acute way in front of your boss. The aspiration that goes along with those fears might be doing some very visible, impactful work, getting a raise, getting a promotion, making a specific number of additional sales or generating more leads, or becoming a superstar on the team, being known on the team. But note that your opens and click-throughs are always going to be a lot higher if you lead with fear. My 80-20 rule applies here, 80% fear, 20% aspiration, at least if you're trying to really optimize for those open rates and for that psychological marketing. Um, and these are just two, like this, I made up these two subject lines completely, like not based on any product or business, but just as an example to illustrate how effective fear is versus just pure aspiration. Seven biggest time wasters for social media marketers. Is this you? Is definitely guaranteed for sure, going to get a lot more opens then. Seven ways to save more time and be a superstar social media marketer. Essentially, you can put the same content behind that subject line, behind the doorway of that subject line, but more people are going to walk through the first doorway than the second doorway. All right, so this is a really important point I want to make here. Something that happens very often with startup email marketing by which I mean you haven't yet built your email marketing machine, which is the boat that all of you are in, is that we look at the promotional stuff we get in our own inboxes and we simply copy. I've seen a lot of early companies echo the style, tone, calls to action, and all the other elements of mainstream brand emailers that may or may not even be in their own category. I'm thinking, for example, of how much startup email marketing I've seen sounds exactly like the Banana Republic newsletter or the Yelp newsletter or whatever else. So here's the thing. Startups are often, or maybe always, missing the complementary spend that bigger brands have. Complementary spend that allows bigger brands to add more people to their list at alarming rates, to run big budget display or even print campaigns, all of which afford them an inbox buffer and allow them to be 
slightly more blasty, slightly less just direct response or a lot less direct response. When you're a startup, you don't have a brand. No one knows who you are. No one knows what your product does or what it's good for. Instead of running email marketing like a household brand would, I strongly encourage you to take a look at the internet marketers and run your email marketing a little more like them because they are very lean. Um, They don't have like a lot of recognition or a lot of money even to put into product. So I just wanted to go, these are a couple of uh, four emails that I for for real received. Um, I meant to block out some of the from names, but I didn't do that super effectively. But to me, uh, the problem with these email subject lines one by one, exclusive travel specials for Susan. That is not super enticing. Exclu- well, I know it's not exclusive. It just sounds like a form email right away. There's nothing specific about it, and I don't want to open it. Tell us what you think and win a Crunchbase t-shirt. Well, gee, Crunchbase, I don't really care about getting a t- about winning a Crunchbase. If you can guarantee me a Crunchbase t-shirt, okay, maybe I'll complete your survey. But if I'm just going to win a, maybe win a Crunchbase t-shirt to, do, to tell you what I think about Crunchbase, it's not that enticing. Um, April newsletter. Is your brand what matters the most? Good news for you. Okay, who can tell me what's wrong with that subject line? And finally, from a dearly beloved fellow 500 company, Yoga Trail, get your ohm on. Hmm. It's very cute, but it doesn't say a damn thing. And it doesn't invite me. It doesn't entice me. It doesn't allure me. I don't have to. I don't must to open that email. I know that was not good grammar, but I think you guys know what I mean. So the moral of that story is don't be boring. Be psychological. Okay, I think my golden rules are a little bit out of order. Maybe, maybe not. But uh, the next one is deliverability. So in short, deliverability is super, really super duper duper important. Um, You can test it through mail-tester.com. It's free. And then there are more robust tools that are not free, but go ahead and just use mail-tester.com and see what your rating is. And then make sure you have domain keys enabled on your email marketing tool. The best way to do that, because it varies for each, the exact instructions vary a bit for each tool, is to Google it. Just Google enable domain keys plus the name of the email sending tool that you're, the email marketing tool that you're using and figure out what those instructions are and then follow those instructions and do it. Um, and then the other thing is, if you find via mail tester on your mailtester.com results that you're on some kind of spam blacklist, um, really the only way that you can deal with that is to reach out to those blacklists and ask to be removed. Uh, and then once they remove you, then your rating will slowly go up. Target and segment. Okay, don't be random in what you send. Don't be random. Uh, you know more, much more about your subscribers and your users than you think. If you're not all, all fancy with behavior-based triggers, and even if you don't know anything about their dem- demographic profiles, you can at the very least do some basic segmentation based on what channel or what offer brought them in to your site to subscribe. The better you're targeting, the higher the frequency of emails you can send. This is so key. The better you're targeting, the more emails you can send in less time, and the lower your unsubscribe rate will be across all of that. So that means you can do a lot more selling and a lot harder selling to a targeted list. The next golden rule is measure what matters. Some email campaigns will get open rates close to or above 100%, but they may not monetize. Or it may be to a list of just 50 subscribers. Other email campaigns will get open rates below 30% or 20%, but all of those are going to, uh, but it's an email that's a hard sell. It's direct conversion towards a product purchase. So the point, the moral of that story is you need to measure what matters. There's a lot of different metrics that come into play for email marketing, opens, clicks, conversions, subscribes, unsubscribes, and your unsubscribe rate is a very important metric to keep track of. Not not necessarily always to optimize around, but at least to keep track of because that's your email turn. And then my favorite metric of all for myself is replies. 
uh, because that is a really strong leading indicator for engagement and strength of your content and strength of your list. Anyway, the key is that you need to measure what matters for your business. So that could be opens, that could be clicks, that could be pur purchases or conversions from that particular email. Um, it could be replies if you're trying to engage your audience or making sure you're, or trying to make sure you're getting a priority stamp in their busy inbox. But take a look at what your goals are for your email marketing and for your business and measure what matters. All right, the next golden rule is must test. A single email is a world unto itself. Who said this beautiful quote? Oh, wait, it's me. A single email is a world unto itself, meaning there's a shit ton of stuff going on in one single email. And it's a beautiful thing. By that, I mean that there are a lot of things that you can test. And this is just a short list. This is not the comprehensive list. You can test your subject line. And within your subject line, you can test its copy. You can test its length. You can test its emotion. By emotion, I mean whether it uses fear or aspiration, whether it's happy or sad, scary, whatever. Um, you can test your CTA, your call to action. And within that, you can test its language. You can test its size. You can test its color. You can test its commitment level. Low commitment would be learn more. High commitment would be you know, buy now, buy an annual subscription now. Um, you can test your email's content layout. You can test your email's length of its content. You can test showing prices versus not showing prices or including some kind of pricing component or not at all. You can test simple, a simple concept versus a complex concept. You can test including more choices versus fewer choices. You can test your send time. You can test your send day. You can test personalization, which means including the recipient's name or whatever other personal, not only their name actually, but including their name in the subject line or in the email body. Um, and you can test what from name you use. So I've tested on the emails that I send for Distro Snack. It used to say um, Distro Snack, then it said distribution at 500, then it said 500 distribution, then it said 500 startups, and now it says Susan at 500 startups. And I've found that that, la that last one works the best for um, open rates. But just a quick note back to personalization there. Personalization, most people think that personalization just means, uh, Susan, open this email to see who's checking out your profile. It, you think that it means just including the first name of your recipient in the subject line or in the body of the email. But actually, it is so much more than just their name. You can do personalization based on the city that they live in. You can do personalization based on their interests that you know they have a strong interest for. You can do personalization based on their company name. So as an example of that, HubSpot recently sent me some really, because they capture your company name when on their sign-up form, on their subscribe form, they recently sent me some personalized emails that said 500 startups in the subject line and also in the pre you text. And I actually didn't even realize I was being marketed to. I just saw an email in my inbox that was like something, something, 500 startups. And I was like, oh man, that's really important. It's for work. I got to open that. And, and I, I got to the, it was, it wasn't until I got to the very bottom of that email that I realized, oh wait, this is part of their drip campaigns. This is an email that was not just written for me and for 500 startups, but I thought it was very clever, very effective use of personalization that goes above and beyond just using um, that first name personalization. All right, almost done. Content matters. Now, I can't emphasize this one enough. Content matters so, 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 so much. By content, I mean all of these components here. It is not enough just to set up sexy marketing auto automation, buy and scrape a big ass list and then send out crap for content. It's not enough. And you are thus wasting your sexy marketing automation and might as well throw that big ass list straight into the trash can. Take the time and find the resources to create really good content. Now, I love that Nemo on 500 Distro considers copywriting to be an essential growth skill. I feel it is so underrated and so overlooked, and I fully agree. But the thing is, copywriting only affects some of these content components I've listed here, not even all of them. You must pay attention to all of the content that you include in your email, and it must be tailored to what your business needs are and to who your subscribers are. As a side note here, I'm really happy to review any email content with you, with any of you individually. Um, the, def 
the, to me, the definition of really good content, really perfect content, totally depends on your brand, totally depends on your product and your campaign's purpose. So it's best handled case by case. So please reach out to me, calendly.com slash Susan F. Sue. Finally, the most essential sub-golden rule within this considerably super golden rule is one email, one CTA. For any goal-oriented, that is, non-newsletter emails, just do this. Don't ask, no buts, no explanations, just do it. One email, one CTA. Finally, uh, my final golden rule has to do with mobile. And in red here I have over 65% of email gets opened on mobile first. How many of you check your email on, a, on, on your device? Just raise your hands quietly amongst yourselves at home with your headphones on. Just raise your hand, please. Just raise it for me. And then look around the empty room at yourself or maybe other people that are watching this webinar. Okay, so as I mentioned, the official stat is that 65% of email gets opened on mobile devices first. But actually, I personally believe that this should be much higher and that this is much higher, that it's just hard to measure. A lot of email and a lot of email marketing is getting consumed on mobile devices. So you should optimize your email around that. These are some of the most basic guidelines. Uh, always test on mobile, do a responsive layout, content brevity, content brevity, meaning short paragraphs is really key. Maybe even try one sentence, one paragraph. Um, make sure your subject, subject line, your preview text, and the sender name are all mobile optimized because you have a lot fewer characters to work with. Um, these are just the most basic guidelines, but here's the most important one. It's to send yourself your own email as a test and check it on your phone first, just like your user is going to. That should be the reality check that tells you everything you need to know about what you need to change about that email. When the decision comes down to parsing a large block of not very interesting text on my phone versus trashing it immediately, the latter option will always win. Now, the last bullet point here I have is a little bit of a mystery. High open rate but low click rate? What does this mean? So a lot of times we, um, nowadays, because we're so tethered, so hooked into our devices, it's the starting point for a lot of our activities on the web. Um, it's the starting point for shopping activity, for e-commerce activity. It's the starting point for consuming email and for consuming marketing content. But it's not always the finish point. And the reason for that is because sometimes we, while, we're still open, while we are still opening many of our emails on mobile, sometimes it's very hard to follow through on the call to action within that email because um, the, phone experience, the phone experience simply does not allow for it in an easy, optimized, streamlined fashion. If you have a, um, a CTA in there and you're getting a lot of open rates on your email, well, the open rate is a great indicator that people are interested in your email, they're interested in its content, but then they're not really clicking. Don't worry about it. Just realize that probably a lot of them are opening that email on their phone and they don't want to click because most of us don't really like clicking stuff from our phone, uh, from emails on our phone, and then it launches like, you know, Safari browser or whatever browser and might be slow and it's a, you know, we don't know if the website's going to be optimized and uh, mobile optimized and all of that. So if you're seeing high open rates but low click rates, one trick is to do retargeting to the people who opened your email. And you can do that by creating a Facebook custom audience um, using those emails. You can um, export the just the segment of uh, recipients that opened your email but didn't click. And then you can do brand retargeting. You can retarget with an, a special offer, um, just other ways to sort of get them back into that action mode, into that funnel of completion. Okay, so that is all the slides I had for this webinar, but a few of you sent in some questions today about email marketing that I thought were pretty darn sharp, so I'm going to share um, some of those here to wrap up. Eli says, I had a question about copywriting that is not annoying. Do you have any email examples that should be emulated and any that should be avoided? Okay, Eli, my answer to this is yes. I covered some examples of emails earlier in this webinar that can be emulated, but I did not fully cover the don'ts. Here is a shortcut to that. If you send it to yourself or to a smart friend and it doesn't feel natural and good, then it's a don't. The best way to test this is to send that very email to yourself 
And the best, best way to handle this is to avoid being annoying in the first place by using psychological copywriting. Here are a few super common mistakes. One, getting to the punchline too early or asking too much too soon, i.e. asking your ask in the first sentence or even in the first paragraph. Remember, all of marketing is a funnel and your email content itself should be a funnel. Um, another common mistake is taking a me first attitude. So here's the thing, your recipient, remember, they don't care about you, they don't care about your product, they don't care about your brand. You have to convince them to care and you have to do that in a funnelized manner. So if you take a me first attitude and you make it all about you and all about your product and all about your brand rather than your customer or your prospects fears and desires, then you're not gonna get very far. Another common make mistake is talking about yourself too much, talking about your product too much and talking about your customer too little. So as you can see, writing a good email, writing a non-annoying email, isn't so different from the kind of social etiquette you'd employ at a party to be non-awkward and maybe even charismatic. But if you are naturally awkward and non-charismatic, as many of us are, then you can always emulate the best. Swipe what they do, ask me for help, and also stay tuned for a cool new project that I'm rolling out to 500 founders only in the next few weeks, which you'll hear about later. Um, okay, here's another question from Nathan. Nathan asks about scarcity. In all, here's his question. In all five of your example email headlines, time is the variable which you are making scarce. Is this the only variable to attenuate to convey scarcity to drive the CTA, or can you think of others that could work as well or better? Um, so the quick and dirty answer is no, and I went over this a little bit in the webinar, but I'll elaborate here. Time is not the only resource that can be running out. You can also limit quantity, you can limit seats, you can limit um, type, uh, you can limit choice, you can limit all kinds of availability. Um, so again, think of the Kickstarter example, or think of really hot products on Amazon as an example of uh, how scarcity can be leveraged apart from time. All right, that is it for email marketing for today. Uh, to get more love, please sign up for my office hours at calendly.com slash Susan F. Sue. And stay tuned for more on my secret email project in the next few weeks. I'll be sending out some more info about that. And once again, I'm always very, very happy to get questions by email, questions by office hours, questions by Skype, and I look forward to connecting more with all of you over the next few weeks. Thank you so much for your attention today and all of your attention on during the previous talks, and have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye.